In this video, I'm going to analyze the digit patterns of the uh, numbers from the presidential election 2020. I'm going to talk about my source data, a bit of data cleansing, what I expected to see. I give you the Benford results, and I have two surprises. My results show no signs of intentional misconduct and no signs of intentional or unintentional errors. The purpose of this video is just to tell you how I got to that conclusion. Milwaukee, the largest city in Wisconsin and original home to the typewriter. Data, ex expand, collapse, total by wards. I have 478 wards. I have the count for Mr. Biden, Mr. Trump, and we'll also see for Mr. Jorgensen. I start by looking at the registered voters by ward. Downloaded this data and had a closer look at it. I saw that there were maybe 578 wards here. And what happened was in the election, they consolidated some of the wards. We can see one and two over here. Village of Bayside, oops, it was one and three that were combined. 1S and 3S, 1S and 3S. A little bit of an issue here. I see number 5, but I don't see number 6 over here. I'm guessing that this was just 5 and 6. These things happen. I had to do some work, take this data, and consolidate it where necessary so that I had the registered voters per ward for my 478 wards. Data cleansing is one of the steps in most data analysis projects. Registered voters, 478 wards, 478 numbers. I did a reconciliation to see that I reconciled with my source. Lowest number of voters, zero. Highest number of voters, 4,104. But that's an extreme. That's at the end. I started by doing a histogram of these numbers to see the lay of the land. A histogram. These are the numbers from 0 to 99, and there were, I'm guessing, four of them. These are the numbers from 100 to 199, very few of them. This was where most of the action was, and this is at 700 to 799, almost 50 wards. 800 to 899, almost 50 wards. 900 to 999, lots. And this is the category 1000 to 2000. I have a histogram. It's skewed. Uh, this is how they have divided the wards. And this is indeed going to influence my digit patterns rather severely. All of these numbers have got a first digit. One, I'll say what I mean by first digit in a moment. These numbers all have a first digit nine, eight, and seven. So when I do a graph of the first digits, I'm going to expect lots of ones, nines, eights, and seven. This is the first digit of a number. It is the leftmost digit. And this is what a Benford's Law analysis is all about. Benford's Law gives me the expected pattern of the first digit and accounting and finance, uh, earth science, Population and numbers follow Benford's law very well. We will see in a moment election results don't. Under Benford's law, I expect 30.1% of my numbers to start with a 1. I expect 17.6% to start with a 2. I expect 12.5% to start with a 3. And the poor old 9, only expected as a first digit, 4.6% of the time. Indeed, we can see... No high first digits here. Oh, there is a 9. This is 100% of the data. I have analyzed the digit patterns of the wards. Lots of first digit 1s, lots of 7s, 8s, and 9s, as expected from this graph over here. My first question is, what would happen if a candidate got 10% of the vote? The answer is that their graph would look exactly like this, because... When I multiply numbers by 10%, all I'm really doing is 0.1, moving the decimal place. The digits stay intact. 
If I'm multiplying it by 0 0.01, again, the digits stay intact, but I have moved the decimal place. If I multiply any number by an integer power of 10, all I'm doing is moving the decimal place, the digits stay intact. If a candidate got 10% of the votes, their graph would look exactly like the 100% graph because they would have the same digits, lower numbers, but the same digits. What would happen with a candidate that got exactly 20%? Let's think this one carefully. All of these numbers, 700 to 799, 800 to 899, 900 to 999, all of these numbers would have a first digit, 1. In this group here, the 1000s, if I multiply by 20%, a lot of them would have a first digit, 2. This group here, not very big, would have a first digit, 3. Let's see what it looks like. Yes, in fact, I have lots of 1s, 2s, and 3s, and not much else. A candidate getting 20% of the vote in each ward would have a digit graph looking like this. 40% first digit 1s, 30% first digit 2s. What about 30%? Well, all of these numbers from 1000 to, I think, about 1700, would have a first digit 3. Over here, I would have sort of lots of first digit 2s. Let's see what we get. Aha! Lots of 2s, lots of 3s. The graph has changed. This is the 30% graph. This is the 40% graph. Let's think about the 50% graph. All of these numbers from 1000 to 2000 if I multiply them by a half, this group would have a first digit 5. This group over here would have a first digit 3. I would have first digit 4. First digit 4. I think I'm going to have lots of 4s coming from here. Some 3s and some 5s. Let's see where it is. Yes, I have lots of 3s, 4s and 5s. You can go back, pause the video and see what you expect. 60, 70% of the votes, and you're a candidate getting 80% of the votes. Watch what happens. It's almost as if we sort of move this across. It falls off the edge and comes back here. It moves across, falls off the edge, comes back here. It moves across, falls off the edge, and comes back here. What about a candidate getting 90%? This again is a bit of a trick question. You see, 90% is really close to 100%. So in most of the cases, the first digit is the same. So the 90% graph looks eh, pretty much like the 100% graph. Let us go have a look at our actual results. Mr. Biden, although his vote percentage was an average of 69%, his median was 60%. And with a median of 60%, this graph over here, the 60% graph, is going to be the dominant graph. It's going to look pretty much like this. However, it was 60%, and we can see it went up to nearly 70, and it also went down a bit. These are the percentiles. So what I have here is the um, 20th percentile and I think the 80th percentile. Uh, I'm going to check that and put it back in the notes as to what percentiles those were. This is the dominant graph. This one will slightly influence it, as will this. Let's see. Lots of 4s and 5s. Lots of 4s and 5s. Yeah, not so many, but lots of 5s. Each graph has got lots of fives. Here we have lots of fives. All of them, the first digit is one proportion is less than the Brentford proportion. And over here I get the one percent less. The two is looking rather constant and measly over here. On average, this, these are Mr. Biden's results. Therefore, the reason that his graph looks like this 
is because the median for each ward was call it 60 percent and this is his biggest influence followed by these two which would be a peripheral influence mr trump's median for the ward was 18.81 call it 20 percent you would think that the 20 percent graph would dominate but not so this does not look like the 20 percent graph it doesn't look like the 20% graph matched even with the 30 and the 10% graph. This here doesn't look much like this or this combined with that. Something else is happening. When I look at Mr. Trump's percentage of the votes received, this is 0 to just below 2. This is 2 to just below 4. This is 4 to just below 6. Uh, they're going up in increments of 2%. I see lots of here in the 2 to 4% range. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> what is happening is the median is over here. The 20% graph has some influence, but it is dwarfed. The 10% graph is also exerting a lot of influence, as is the 30, as is the 40. We know that the 1% graph, somewhere in here, the 1% graph looks like the 10% graph. The 2% graph will look like the 20% graph. Remember that table? If you multiply by 20% or you multiply by 2%, you keep the same digits. So over here, we have an influence of the 20% <coughs> graph and the 30% graph. In fact, we have an influence of the 40%, 50%, 60 70 80 90 Almost everything is influencing the Trump graph the Trump graph is tending towards Benford's law because Benford's law is indeed the limiting distribution under multiplication. Get an Excel spreadsheet. In your first field, put population numbers. In your second field, put stock prices. In your third field, put company total revenues. In the fourth field, stream flow statistics, followed by baseball batting averages, followed by the distance between cities. If you got 10 and you multiplied these numbers by each other so that in the 11th field you had the product of the first 10 numbers, your result would be absolutely beautifully Benford. If you did only five fields, it would be close to Benford, but not perfect. As you add fields to the multiplication, at the limit, it will tend to Benford's law. And what it seems is, that I take the, uh, uh, the number of voters per ward, the number of registered voters, and when I multiply it across here by a host of numbers going all from zero all the way up to 50%, because of this spread, the multiplication ends up giving me something closer to Benford's law. This is because the Trump numbers are not tightly confined to a nice narrow range. Here is the treat. I got the 2016 numbers, downloaded them, cleansed the data, 478 wards. I now have Donald Trump counts and I have Senator Clinton Trump's uh, accounts. This is what one of the records looks like. Senator Clinton, 2016, Vice President Biden, 2020, same county, same number of wards. The graphs are pretty much the same. The graphs are the same. In this case, I can compare Mr. Trump 2020 to Mr. Trump himself 2016. These graphs are pretty much the same. Uh, probably the same distribution of the number of votes per um, ward. The graphs are the same. Let's just go through some parts of my book that have to do with what I've spoken about now. Over here, the main steps where I said we need to cleanse our data. A histogram described in chapter two. Benford's law, what I talk about here is the scale invariance theorem. And what that says is if I have a set of numbers that follow Benford's law, and I multiply each number by a constant, not zero, but by a constant, 
The new set of data will also follow Benford's law, and it is only the uh, uh, proportions of Benford's law that has this property. What we saw for most of the vote counts here, we had the 100%, and when I multiply it by 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 90, I get a different distribution. That's because my starting distribution was not Benford. Mean absolute deviation, this is how I measure conformity. The last two digits test, we didn't do that. We're sticking to the first digit now. And indeed, in chapter 11, I talk about other tests that could be useful. In chapter 10, I talk about uh, Mr. Biden's tax returns. The tax returns looked fine. We also had Joe Jorgensen. He got, on average, 1% of the vote. His mean absolute deviation, and the mean absolute deviation is, I look at the deviations, doesn't matter whether it's up or down, I take the absolute, there's no deviation there. I take the absolute value of the deviation, and I get the average. His average deviation, 0 0.0158, that means he's off on average by 1.58%. And I have a table in my book where I talk about what's big and what's not big. If we go above 0 0.015, we have non-conformity. But he was just a hair's breadth above 0 0.015. In fact, if we lower this by just a little bit, he'll end up in the marginally acceptable conformity category. Joe Jorgensen is the closest fit to Benford's law of all three candidates. And it's quite surprising because his counts went from zero, he got zero, all the way up here to, call it 2.5% uh, of the counts. His number of votes went from zero to 55. In fact, he didn't get anything over 55. His highest two-digit number was 55. And if we have a single-digit number, of which he had plenty, seven, three, and the like, then the first digit of seven is Seven. I think this is once again, I'm going back, because of the spread and because of multiplying by the uh, number of registered voters in the county, we end up getting Benford's Law. Although for uh, Mr. Jorgensen, we have one more thing in our favor. This distribution here is approximately a log normal distribution. And because I am multiplying by a log normal distribution. This should give me Benford's law. In fact, if we took a perfect log normal distribution, my best guess is that we would end up with a set of data that follows Benford's law. If we have two candidates and the split is 90-10, the 10% person is going to have a graph that looks pretty much like the 100% graph because I've just moved the decimal place in all these numbers. The 90% person is also going to have a graph that looks like the 100% graph, because his or her numbers will be close to the 100% numbers. They'll have the same first digit in most of the cases. If I have a 50-50 split, the two candidates will have the same distribution, because when the one count, a person has 320, the other person has 328. Uh, the numbers are so close that the first digit should be the same in every case or in almost all the cases. The distribution of the candidates will depend on the distribution of the sizes of the precincts. It will also tend to be conditioned on the number of precincts the more precincts, the more stable these distributions will be. The spread of the percent of the votes, as we saw for Mr. Trump and Mr. Jorgensen, that spread, the bigger that spread and the more it looks like a log normal distribution, the closer will be the fit to Benford. Benford cannot detect election errors unless these errors are pervasive and systematic. I prefer the first two digit test as opposed to the first digit test but I didn't have enough records to use the first two digit tests. There are other tests that could pick up other forms of misconduct. I said why we had a closer fit for two of the people than for Mr. Biden, 
and it had nothing to do with fraud errors or misconduct. I have a website, Benford's Law Material, my YouTube videos, my blog, my book. Go there, enjoy, it's all free. You don't have to register. I hope you've enjoyed this video and so from me to you. Bye-bye.